Good evening and welcome to episode three of the Saints and Sinners podcast. Now today is a very special interview for me because I didn't think I'd be able to get someone huge on such a small platform as we've only just recently started our channel. However, if you like what you see, we'd like you to like and subscribe today. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to my guest, Tristan Tate. How did you manage to get such a big name on your interview, Rory? I mean, I don't understand. You just started on Rumble. Your channel's relatively small. How did you manage to get such a big name on your podcast? I'm impressed. I don't know. I mean, it took a lot of convincing, but I mean, we're here now, <clears throat> so we're going to get it going. I've, uh, I've wanted to do this interview for a little while now, and, and I think I've got some good questions today, some questions that people would like answers to. Well, you, um, are, you are in a very unique position, and for those of you who don't know at home, the reason he got me on this interview is because I've known him since he was 18 and he's currently at my house. So I thought, why not? And he is actually in a very unique position because he could probably get away with asking me things that most people wouldn't and most people would be scared to ask. So I don't know what the questions he's going to ask me are, but I'm, I'm very interested in what you've got to say. Do you know what? I think the title of this interview will be called The Life of Tristan Tate because we're going to go over a few subjects of, you know, your upbringing, uh, where you started and everything else. And, yep. You know, and then we're going to later move on to the more modern sort of stuff. So, okay. cool, Ready. without further ado, let's, let's go. Ready when you are. Okay, so let's start from your childhood and your family life growing up in America, mm -hmm. because obviously I didn't know you then, you know. So, first off, your mum was originally from Luton, right? Yeah, so my parents actually met at an Air Force base near Luton called Chicksands, where American, where American Air Forcemen and soldiers would go out and have a bit of a party, and there, always, there were some local English girls around, and my dad, obviously being the big, black, strong, handsome man he was, saw that little, bright, little pretty white <laughs> English girl at Chick's Hands and managed to promote you know, 12 years of marriage and three kids out of her. So well done to him. But yeah, I was born in the United States. See, that's very interesting because Chick's Hands is actually very local to Luton anyway. Yeah. I think it's about 15 minute drive away. That's so, a Yeah, so Eileen met Emery at Chick's Hands and from there, she obviously fell head over heels in love with Emery. Can't and remember. then I'm guessing Emery moved Eileen to the States, is that right? Absolutely. I was born in Washington, D.C., Walter Reed Medical Center. I believe that's the same hospital that presidents go to. So I was really? Born, yeah, I was born in the Walter Reed Medical Center, but I don't remember any of Washington, D.C. Okay, so obviously you were very young at the time. So what was your first, where was your first school? Like where, so I thought you were from Illinois. No, no, no. So, so the reason me and Andrew say Chicago is because nobody knows where anything is in the United States. People know New York, California, Miami. So if I'm in Turkey and people say, where in England are you from? I say London. Because right. Luton's close. Of course. So I'm not even from Illinois at all. I grew up in a state called Indiana, which is the state next to Illinois. So I lived in a very small town called Goshen. Now I had a grandfather in Chicago. Chicago is a good five, six hours drive away from where I am. But if you're trying to make somebody imagine on, in America where I lived, I just say, oh, Chicago. The Chicago area. Dad grew up near Chicago. It was just, it's just an easier explanation to the foreigners. But yeah, I grew up in Indiana. Okay, so let, let's talk a bit more about your upbringing in America. So did you have a nice family home? Were you, did you live in a nice area? Did you go to a nice school? Uh, no, not really. So, I mean, the situation with my father, we, we, me and Andrew never really go into it. But essentially, he was a success, successful man up until I was about two years old. So I don't remember ever having any money or anything good. Right. So he used to travel around playing chess. You know, he, he fought with the military for a decade trying to get his old job back, which yeah. ultimately failed. He never did get his job back with the military. He never got any back pay. He never got financial compensation or anything like that. Yeah. So I always remember being poor, even when I was living in America, because my first memories of going to other people's houses, I'm like, oh, I live in a bedroom with my brother and my sister. We have one room that yeah. we all share. That was the kids' room. You've yeah. got your own bedroom? Stuff like that was mind blowing to me at age four or five. I mean, <clears throat> and your school there? Your school was was it a good school? Was you, it? You know what's funny? I now realize that I'm famous enough that when I start saying the names of schools and stuff, yeah, people might contact me from the past. Or okay, the same school. I went to <clears throat> Chandler Elementary School in Goshen, Indiana. That was my first ever school. See, I, I knew to. I knew this. I knew that was Goshen, Indiana. That's mm. right. So let's talk about your sibling relationships growing up. Obviously, I know you're very close to Andrew. You always yeah. have been as long as I've known you guys. You Then there's Janine as well. So were you guys close growing up? I'm, you know, I, I feel like sibling rivalry, you know, boys 
fighting and arguing is a very normal part of growing up. You know, we used to punch each other, that kind of thing. Of course, yeah. You've got brothers yourself. Yeah. Um, I think our superpower was as we came into adulthood and realized how alone we were on earth, like, or in the world, that we transformed that kind of rivalry or any um, jealousy or anything we had for each other into teamwork. Into a partnership, Yeah, right? but, but you don't think that way at eight or nine years of, old, uh, of age. If you've got an older brother who steals your stuff, you try to punch him. And of course. He, Listen, punch, he punches you back I, I think that's a common trait across every sibling you know, relationship in the world. But, you know, let's, let's talk about chess. When, when did you start playing chess? Because I've seen articles on Andrew winning chess competitions from when he was five years old. You know, when did, when did your dad get you boys to start playing chess? And so what's interesting now is I'm going to start teaching my daughter chess now and she can't even speak properly. The reason being, I don't remember ever not knowing how chess pieces moved. So I don't know how old I was when he taught me but I never have that memory of sitting down saying, how does this piece move? How does this piece move? My earliest recollections of chess, maybe I was three, three and a half. My earliest recollections of sitting at the board, I knew how the pieces moved already. So for as long as you can remember, you've naturally oh, yeah. learned where all, how I've, all the pieces I've, 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 There's not a single point in my life when I can remember not knowing how to play chess that's, or learning how to play chess. That's insane. I remember studying chess, but actually learning the rules of the game, how to set them up. It feels like I've always known it. So he must have taught me before I could speak. Crazy, crazy. So I, you went to school, Chandler Elementary or whatever the school was called. Yeah. And then after this, your mum and dad had a breakup. They, they, you know, they broke up. What, what age were you then? Jesus, I was about seven and a half, eight. And the, yeah. and the reasons for the breakup weren't so much the marriage being on the rocks. I, I believe the reason for the breakup, as it is most marriages and most breakups, was financial. You have to understand in America, if you're broke, you can't go to the hospital. There's yeah. no healthcare if you're broke. It's not like the NHS in England where you can do whatever you like and just go yeah. to the hospital, call an ambulance at whatever hour of the day you want and it's free. Yeah, I know. You know so you, you get charged thousands of pounds for an ambulance in America. Yeah, it? no, thousands, tens yeah. of thousands sometimes. So I think the main discussion of my parents' divorce was around medical care because we were in a situation where they would tried so hard for so long to keep their heads above water, but they were now at the point where the medical insurance for the family was lapsing. So me, my brother, and my sister, if anything happened, there yeah. was no going to hospital because that's the way America is. Crazy. Or if you do go to hospital, you're now in debt forever. So being British citizens, there was a discussion about them perhaps staying together. Yeah. But certainly for now, my mom had to take the kids and go over to England. See, that's very interesting. So it was the financial pressure on the relationship it was financial. that made your mum make that decision. But to take I, I, think, I think a lot of divorces and a lot of breakups are break financial pressure. I've, listen, I've, I've seen it. If, I've seen it in a lot of my friends' parents' relationships. I've seen it happen. If you take time. married couples where they're both working, they're both trying to juggle jobs, incomes, you know, the, they have arguments about what to spend the family money on. The guy wants to buy too much beer. The woman wants to buy too many clothes. They fall out all the time. And I just feel like it's not great but a lot of marriages could be solved by giving them $10 million. Like a lot of the problems in yeah. most families could be solved by saying, here's stay married, here's $10 million. Yes. Just chill out and don't work anymore. So it's why, it's one of the reasons that me and Andrew always preach about, you know, financial success and, and making money and all the things that we always talk about because we understand that as, as, as ugly as it is, I guess, that the world revolves around money in such a way. It's not just the world, it's your relationships, your marriages, your family, the dynamic you have with your kids, it all revolves around money in one way or another because it, it can make things a lot better and money can also make things a lot worse, but being broke is harder than being rich. Which moves me on to my next question. You moved to England when you were very young. Mm. Eight. Did that have a big impact on you as a child? Did it make you feel it? Did you miss America when you first moved to England? Did, you know, how, how was that move for you? Moving country when you're a kid is very difficult. And England and America are extremely different countries. So I lived in a country with a forest and nature and I could run outside and play in the woods. And that was very much my, my childhood and my, my lifestyle, I guess, as a seven-year-old, riding bikes around. And then I moved into the middle just north of Berry Park in Luton. Marsh uh, Farm? At the, no, no, no. no? The, the homeless shelter we lived in was on Studley Road, the same road as the fire station. I know station. Studley Road. Anyone from Luton will know Studley Road, I'm yeah, sure. It's the fire yeah. station road. It's now been demolished and it's a bunch of flats now, but there used to be a house there that was owned by the government. It was like a homeless shelter for homeless families. So there I am in the middle of there. The closest park, I guess, is Wardown Park, but if you go down there, you're going to get stabbed or robbed. Or, well, these days, yeah, yeah, absolutely. These, these days. days. I mean, yeah. it still wasn't that great it wasn't, 20, no, 25 it years ago. The, the ice cream store there is still running. Yeah, yeah it's still there. It's still, it's still going. The same one. Who yeah. goes to Berry Park nowadays, especially with your kids? Yeah. 
But no, I, I, so I, I moved to country and it was, it was very difficult for me to readjust mm -hmm. to the educational system. To Which is what I'm asking you. Did, you found that part tough? Surely, mm -hmm. I mean, so what was your first primary school in England? Because you, you must have been primary I went, school. I went to Icknield High School, Icknield Junior School. Icknield Juniors? Icknield yeah. Juniors, and I was year five when I started. So I did two years of Icknield Juniors. And then ironically, because the, the house that the government put us in after the homeless shelter wasn't in the Icknield catchment area, I had only just made a bunch of new friends. So I was 10 at this point. I've been, right. like, I've been in England two years. I'd only just made a bunch of new friends. And then suddenly everyone's going to the same high school and I have to go to a different one. So, you, so I lost all my friends again two years ago. So you later. went to Lee Manor from yeah, Icknill. From Icknill. And that, that's not normal yeah. in the catchment area. No, right? it was me and, me and four other people. I still remember their names. Lawrence Dakini, Taisha, da Taisha Davis, and Mark Curtin. Those oh, are the, yeah. I've heard a few stories about you and Mark. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Mark's a good friend of mine. So those are the, I still to this day, isn't that weird? That all these years later, I remember the only four people from yeah. McNeil Junior And you'll never forget. And I haven't said the words Lawrence Dakini or Taisha Davis in 14, 15 years. I haven't even heard of them. But uh, yeah, I still remember four of us from that school got to go, go to the manor. So yeah, that sucked. Did but, you ever deal with a lot of, you know, so being an American kid with an American accent, did you deal with a lot of, you know, not so much bullies, but you, did you ever have any conflict for being the American kids or...? You know, no, no, no one cares if you're American. I, I think that culturally you're, you're different and you know that you're different. Yeah. I think nowadays British kids and American kids are a lot more similar than they were back then. You know, before the internet, before TV shows mixed the cultures too much. England was England and America was America. Uh, no, I didn't really get any trouble for it. If, if anything, people thought it was cool that I was American. Yeah, I, so, I did think that. Yeah, yeah. So people more wanted to talk to me more. But no, I've never in my life had any cases of, of bullying or anything like that. And I've always been quite headstrong and stood up for myself. Anyway, Listen, you've so. never been scared of a straightener, I'll tell you that much. I've never been so, scared of a straightener. What I will say is, so you went from Icknield to Lee Manor. Lee Manor, quite renowned for being quite a rough school. The worst school in Luton, mm. which is one of the worst towns for education. I mean, it's Ofsted country. reports weren't great. Yeah, I've heard it's doing much better these days. Do you know what? I think they've had a revamp of the school. It's been renovated and they've got new they've teachers revamped, in. And... They've revamped the entire council estate. Yeah. But when I was at the school, it was under a state of what's called special measures. So the government was actively inspecting the school every like four to five days to stop crime and drugs and all the teachers were just like I remember at the time it was, it was really rough. Yeah. And yeah they I weren't remember. hiring teachers yeah. on contracts. They were hiring like specialist teachers who were yeah. like ex-police officers and stuff. Crazy. It was really bad when I went to it. So Crazy. So, Shout out to Mr. Snake, turned it around. He's probably <laughs> dead by now, I don't know, he was the head teacher. So going on the, the topic of Lee Manor being quite run down when you went there and the, you know, yeah. the education wasn't great, how did you and Andrew become so articulate and so knowledgeable? Well, education is more than what you learn in school. In fact, mm -hmm. I, I believe education is uh, nothing to do with school at all. You know, they're some of the smartest people in the world. I've sat in pubs with people who have knowledge and you know, info, access to information or information in their brain that blows people's minds because uh, they live shitty lives. They sit, they, they sit in the park all day and read books and read newspapers and drink at the pub all night. They're still nowhere and they're still nobodies, but they've self-educated. So when people say to me, Tristan, you're uneducated, technically mm -hmm. I'm uneducated because I don't have a university degree. Mm -hmm. I know much more about many more things than almost anyone I know who has a university but degree. But where, course, did, where did that discipline come from? Because obviously your dad was in America, yeah. right? Your mom was in England with you guys. She had enough on her hands trying to raise three kids by herself and Luton. That's, yeah. That in itself is a task. Where did you get the discipline to educate yourself you know, and make yourself that? Did you read a lot of books? Did you read I, did, I did read a lot of books, but it was more out of curiosity than discipline. I, I could lie and say that when I was a kid, I was focused on learning things and I wanted to know everything. It's not really true. I just, um, you know, there was libraries are free. I was bored. There was no yeah. inter source of entertainment in the world. Yeah. I remember being at year five, learning about stupid things like the ancient Greeks. And as an American, I'd never heard of Greece. So I was like, <laughs> what? what the, who are the ancient Greeks? I, remember, so I'm eight years, nine years old at this point. I had no idea who they were. So I would go to the library and get books out about them and start reading about them and try to educate myself. So when I sit with most people from any walk of life, there, there's at least a conversational topic I can hold with them. Yeah. But it wasn't about discipline when I was young. It was about curiosity. And then it was about being poor and being broke and having nothing else to do really than to, than of to course. read books. Yeah. But I mean, you see my room now, it's full of books. People don't, people so, don't know how much I read. I can't say the same for most people that went to Lee Manor in, at your age. <laughs> yeah, I don't you know. know. I, yeah. You know, a lot of them. A lot of them are in jail. Which is, which is why I asked the question, you mm -hmm. know, like what made you choose that different path? However, what I will say is 
When did you and Andrew decide that you were going to start fighting? You're both renowned fighters. Andrew's a four-time world champion, as most people know, in kickboxing. Yourself, yeah. you fought for British and European titles. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I went to them fights, which yeah. you fought brilliantly in. Yep. It's, what um, age did you start fighting and why? You know Luton, man. Yeah. There, there's nothing to do. And people say, why did you choose kickboxing? Why didn't you choose boxing? Why didn't you choose rugby? Why didn't you choose this? Like, it was simple as I was broke and there was a kickboxing gym in Luton. The best sporting facility in Luton was a kickboxing gym. Sure, there are some good boxing gyms and there's some good other things, but Andrew discovered this kickboxing gym. How old was Andrew? 16, maybe? 16? 16. He yeah. was doing his last year of high school. I and think. how did you meet Amir? You know, how did you, how did you decide, right, I'm going to go Storm Gym and, you know, how, what made you choose? Well, Andrew had been a few times and uh, Amir had beaten Andrew up quite badly on his first visits. It was back in the old school, you know. Nowadays, you couldn't do that if some kid turned up at your gym. Amir's gyms, ruthless, bro. Beat him up and he'll never change his ways. No, he'll yeah. never change. Amir's but... not for soft people to go no. into his gym. That's just not Amir's style. No, but it was, um, yeah, I think we just found a, a good affinity with him. We had a good relationship with him. Uh, we looked up to him, I guess, like an older brother or a father figure, you know, back in the day. And, you know, he's, he's smart. He's powerful. He fought in that war that I found incredibly interesting. He was just one of those characters I just gravitated. Amir is a character. I gravitated towards yeah. him. He is a massive character. And he was here two weeks ago. So Guys, if anyone hasn't heard Amir's stories, I can tell you now, you could sit with Amir for an hour and listen to them. And they'll blow you out of the water because yeah. honestly, how is that man not dead? Yeah. He's, like, he's, he's unkillable. Yeah. You know? And most people from Eastern Europe watching this will know about the Yugoslavian conflict. So he, yeah, was, the, he was one of the Bosnians. So but he was special forces in Bosnia. He was, he was well known, Indeed right? Indeed he was. So that was, uh, yeah, so I gravitated towards Amir and it was just, it became one of those things. What else is there to do? Mm -hmm. Okay, you finish work. Um, I, first it was school, but then as I got older, you finish work. Then what do I do? Go home and do what? Play video games? Jerk off? Like, no. I, I know you two boys have got way too much energy. You to go to the kickboxing that, gym. Right? Of course. You're beaten up, you get tired, you wake up the next morning, you go to work, you come home from work, what's there, what, what's there to do tonight? Nothing, kickboxing gym. Occasionally go out on a Friday or Saturday night, but what else was there really to do? I feel like, and I'm going to go on a bit of a rant. No, let's do it. I feel like the talent pools of athletes, musicians, anything that's moderately impressive, is being, they're being diluted and they're vanishing in today's world. So when I was in jail in January, I saw a uh, music video where Jimmy Page, the guitarist from Led Zeppelin, was playing the guitar. And Andrew went, fucking hell, he's good. How did he get so good? I said, I'll tell you how he got so good. Because every boy who was 14 or 15 got a guitar for his birthday. Yeah. And millions of them tried to learn how to play. And a few became very, very good. You identified through the use of guitars, the most talented guitarists in the world. How many 16 year old boys get guitar for their birthday nowadays? None. What do they get? A PlayStation. What do they yeah. get? A Nintendo. Yeah. So boxing, I feel like is in its, sadly, its last great era, if we call leg. it that. Yeah. Because if you think of fighters, great fighters like Floyd Mayweather, who spent Oscar De La Hoya, who spent years in the amateurs fighting for nothing. Mike Tyson. On pure sponsorships. Yeah. Hundreds of amateur fights, not making any money, not getting any clout, not getting any glory. For 10 years maybe, but for the first time they ever have a fight that's even on television, the talent was so refined by the sheer number of people participating in the sport or participating in learning how to sing or dance or play guitar or box or ice skate that you got super talented people. Now I look around at the Western world and every young man, everyone, 15, 16, out of shape, scrolling on TikTok. That's what they're doing. Yes. So what are we going to do? Discover the world's best fucking serial masturbators? <laughs> like, where's the talent pools now? You don't have any talent pool to pick any talent from. So I think it's all going downhill. But yeah, I stayed with kickbox. Which brings me on to my next question. What age did you and Andrew leave your mum's house and decide that you were going to go and live together? Well, we lived separately at first because we were very young and that house was too... Two men of our size living in that house. Two big guys living in that house. We're too big for that house. Yes, yeah, right. I can, I so, can imagine you drove Eileen mad. Yeah, we drove her yeah. insane. So I actually left when I was 15, when I was working at that sandwich shop. I made a, you know Peter. I made a friend, yeah. a guy from Slovakia named Peter. And he lived in this house where the Eastern Europeans who moved to England, I guess they still do it today, but it was certainly a lot more popular back then, where they would uh, rent one house and everybody would pay the rent share for one room. So it's like a shared house and yeah. you all chipped yeah. in yeah. to so pay I, the rent I, to the I landlord. paid 190 pounds a month, which was affordable at my salary. And that was go, at Pret? Yeah, working at, working yeah. at Pret, making sandwiches. So your first ever job was Pret? Yes, yeah. working at the airport, making sandwiches. And, and what I, did Andrew do? Andrew was working in the fishmongers in the market. 
Ah, yeah, yeah I, know, I know the fishmongers. So Andrew's, yeah. Famous K. Ashley fishmongers in Luton Market. Yeah. Insane. So Andrew was working at the fishmongers for many years. They need to yeah. put up a plaque or something with his face on it behind the counter. Yeah. I think they should. <laughs> I feel like the Pret at Luton Airport should have put up a picture of my face as well. Do you know what? I was there recently before I came here to yeah. stay with you guys. I've, I went to Luton Airport and departures and I went to Pret and I got a sandwich and I thought, fucking hell. When you posted that on Twitter, some kid messaged me saying, ha ha, you really worked there. I still work there now. Yeah. And I started DMing him asking like, who did you still know? Because all the people who worked there when I worked there, yeah. turns out one of the guys I worked night shift with went on to be the manager. And when that kid first started, that guy was his manager. So this guy had that guy's number. Wow. So I got my friend Richard's number off this kid because you posted that on Twitter. Wow. So uh, I've reconnected with an old friend I used to make sandwiches with. So, so. I remember when, you know, I, I first met you and Andrew, you know, I, I was... I met Andrew, funny enough, we had a debate on Bebo and, you know, you we were arguing, we were arguing on Bebo, yeah. me and Andrew on a different social network that a lot of the young man, a lot of the young men won't know what that is nowadays. Yeah. No, me and Andrew met up and we had a fight and, you know, I, I got my ass handed to me. That's fine. And after that, we, we actually realized we had a lot in common in, in you know, terms of our views and our t sense of humor. And that's when I met you guys. You lived in a town called Hitchin in an apartment. Right? Indeed. I was, do I was, I wasn't doing too badly when you met me. I mean, I wasn't doing great, but. How old was I? So I must have been about, what, 20? But there were, there were times when you guys were struggling, right? Yeah, no, it, it got worse after I met you. Yeah. Hitchin was okay. Then when I was living in Dunstable, it had gotten really bad. So yeah, like, yeah. I, I've had my ups yeah. and downs in life. You know, the, 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 the path to success isn't one big straight graph on its way up. Which you know? brings me on to my next question. What was the hardest point for you and Andrew in terms of financially? The hardest you know? point financially, me and Andrew had were partners in a company that made television commercials. So it was essentially a phone sales office where everyone would make lots of calls every day to all sorts of different businesses and try to convince them to buy television advertising. Now, television advertising was big and it was popular and everybody wanted to do it. So when we first started the business, that was a, a, when you met me. I, was I remember Hitchin. you were doing telephone sales, I, is I that had, right? I had a bit of money. I had a nice flat that I was renting. We had that Porsche Boxster car that was on finance. It was the a Porsche finance Boxster S, the red yeah. one. It Jeez, was on a finance that's agreement. bringing back the years now. But the thing is, television advertising, we didn't have any foresight. The internet killed television advertising. And we were still trying to sell these television advertising campaigns. We still had a few clients that were still hanging on. But there was a year, the year when, um, the year when I was living in that flat in Dunstable, when I couldn't afford the electricity. I remember. That year, I think for the entire 12 month period, me and Andrew made probably less than seven or eight grand total. Didn't it get to a point where you were using the communal electric yeah. from the hallway to run into the flat? Yeah, so we, we ran out of electricity. We put an extension wire yeah. in the hallway and ran it into the apartment yeah. to charge our phones and our computers and stuff. Yeah. And you couldn't, have, uh, you couldn't close the door because the wire was too thick. I remember these times so because- Knives Andrew, under the pillow. Andrew and Tristan used to make this dish and it was called Flavor. And it was the most bland dish you could ever have. And it was made of cheap mints, rice, sweet corn and peas. And beans, kidney and beans. Kidney beans all thrown into a pot. So it had everything you needed to, to train and to survive. Yeah. But you used to freeze big pots of that yeah. for the week. But we um, ate the same thing every day. Yeah, I remember yeah. I used to do it with you. you and the, and those were the, those, that was also the year where I, I'd go to KFC. Everyone knows that story. That's right, that's the, the, where the KFC yeah, story is. I'm not going to repeat right. myself. But it's weird when you, when you become a public figure and you're seen on the internet, people don't understand your, your life story. So people will say, I'll say like, oh, when I was 21, 22, I used to go to KFC and et cetera. And the people would find a picture of me and Andrew at 20 and 21 in that old Porsche Boxster we had on yeah. a finance agreement. And be like, oh, I've look. still got many pictures. And they'll be like, oh, look, that's not true because this was one year before he said that happened. Yeah. There were ups and downs in my life, loads of ups and downs. Which is why I think it's important yeah. for people to know that you weren't always, no, you we, didn't always we, have money. We had people few... were under this illusion that you always had money. No. And that annoys me because I've seen you guys and I've seen your struggle and I've seen what you had mm -hmm. to do to pay your rent. We, you know, before I was 28, I certainly had more hard times than good times. Absolutely. But we, the last few years have been exceptionally easy. Even this one where they send me to jail, it's fine. <laughs> okay, well, which is funny because I know you and Andrew, and I know that you've had the same friends from when I met you guys. Yeah, right. So, you, Marcel, we've got a few good friends. Surely you guys had a criteria as to who you chose as your friends and who you didn't. Because... Obviously, I had bad days. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, you know, I don't think... You know, when, when some people will meet a girlfriend and they'll be like, this, this one's the one. And they'll be like, how do you know? And they'll be like, nope, I just know. I don't think you pick friends. I don't think you really analyze people. Uh, at an older age, now I have to be more careful who I meet. I certainly do find myself analyzing people. What do they want from me is a big question that I have to ask myself now. Absolutely. I'm as wealthy as I yeah. am. 
But back in the day, I don't think that you analyze people on a conscious level. I think it's all subconscious. Mm -hmm. So I can't actually tell you what the criteria was or what, it, what I was thinking at the time or why I hung out with the people who I hung out with. But um, the only thing that I know I've always looked for in friends and people is loyalty. I know that I, I just know that because me and Andrew have always had that. So we couldn't yeah. have anyone in our group who would betray that kind of trust. Which, and concept which I will say with. everyone that I know from, you know, your, your group of friends who are my group of friends too, every single one of them, their loyalty is unmatched. Of course. And I will say that like, no one's ever broke the code. No, and that, that's how I, that's how I've picked them. And I, I didn't do it on purpose, I guess, but you know, I still have those same old group of friends that stand by me. I think I always will. Unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Well, sorry. Or here you are. Right You're stuck now. Yeah. Sorry, bro. So, what was your proudest moment growing up? What was your proudest oh, moment? That, that's an easy story. My proudest moment growing up, I was 24 or 23. The television advertising business had died. I mean, Andrew had moved on to other things. But there was this one client that we were trying to work with. We were trying to get this company on television. Very, very big budgets. Me and Andrew were set to make... I mean, the profit wasn't big. It was like, oh, half a million pounds, but... It all had to be spent on airtime and all this kind of stuff. Right. But me and Andrew were set to make about 60 something thousand pounds. Which back then. Which back then, Ooh. I had never seen more than 15 in my life. Yeah. Yeah. So we were set to make 60 thousand pounds together. And we finally made the commercials and put them on television and we got the deal and we got the money in the bank. And I, we bought an, an old, old Aston Martin. It was an Aston Martin Vantage. Do you remember the first one I ever bought? I do, I remember it very well. We bought this old secondhand Aston Martin Vantage that wasn't in the best shape but it cost us 60,000 pounds exactly. That's everything you had. We scraped, scraped together enough money to pay the insurance for it. And I was driving home from the showroom in Cambridge with Andrew in that car. And that will for, for always be my proudest memory. You see how I buy cars now. The no. other day I was on the phone right where you're sitting there and I bought three Aston Martins yeah, over I, a video call. Yep, yeah, cool, I'll take it, yep, yeah, this color. Now it's lost its magical <laughs> feeling in a way. I enjoy cars and I always will, but that first one, when we were driving that car, the first time I have realized that people are like staring at me, everyone looks when the car goes by, it's because it's an Aston Martin. Mm -hmm. I think now supercars are a bit more common if you live in Bucharest, etc., but or a city that has a lot of money. But sometimes I forget the feeling. Like I'll be, even a year and a half ago, two years ago, I was driving. See, it's nuts that you yeah. bought a car with 60 grand and that's all you had. See, a lot of men would be too scared to do that. They'd use that 60 grand as a safety net. And too. That, and that, and yeah, and that's very poor financial advice because um, buying a car with all 60,000 pounds of your money is, is a poor financial decision. And people still have a go at me about this today. So young people and inter internet entrepreneurs will buy like their first Lamborghini and their first Ferrari. And people will quite, quite rightfully check them and be like, oh, well, you shouldn't have bought that Ferrari. You should have invested it in this. You should have invested it in that. And in one way, they're right. But in another way, I was a 24 year old who owned an Aston Martin outright, no finance agreement, no rental agreements. I was 24 and I owned an Aston Martin. So if you think you get a big chunk of money, it's the only money you're ever going to have in your life. Yeah, invest it, do whatever. But if you believe in yourself, if you believe in your abilities, if you believe in your um, capability as a man to go out and keep conquering, yeah. then by all means buy the Aston Martin because now I can't. What's funny is a lot of people in Luton at the time when you bought that, they would argue to the heavens with me that it was on finance. Yeah, it's I used rented. to have to sit there and tell them, no, they bought it, they yeah. bought it. And people just refuse to believe it. But pe people will only stop saying that when you get to insane levels of money. Mm -hmm. At least twice a day on Twitter, people say, haha, they have a bunch of rented cars. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, well, I rent 40 supercars every day. I'd have to be- That like, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Tate is stitched in the back of my Bugatti seats, but people will always, talk shit and people will always hate on you for doing well in life. But um, yeah, if you're a young man and you've closed your first big deal and you have your first bit of money and there's a car you want, maybe it's a BMW, maybe it's a Mercedes. I would say with all the financial advisors and business nerds on Twitter who will tell me not to say this, I would say go out and buy that car. Yeah. And then that car will increase your image and then continue working, continue grinding and then buy more cars. And it now, motivated you yeah. to do more. Now I can course. buy anything I like. And yeah. now when I buy something stupid, like a, like a Koenigsegg for 4.4 million, like the one that's on its way, and people say- I've seen some of your car purchases. They're yeah. insane. I know. And I mean, they're endless and they're unlimited. And when, it, when that arrives, there's gonna be some nerds like 4.4 million, he could have done this and invested in real estate and bought stocks and bought crypto. Now, you think I don't do that? Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. Now people think that I just buy cars yeah. and I have no portfolios, 
no backup, no savings, no property, yeah. nothing. They have no idea what I invest where. But the fact that I can buy a $4 million car outright means I have at least $4 million cash. Yeah. But I would say that if you see someone like me buying a $5 million car, they've got at least twenty five or thirty cash. And they're doing smarter things with the rest of it. I watched you go on Shipwreck the Island. Ah, uh, Shipwreck! Yeah. Shipwreck the Island Channel 4, I watched you go on it. You were actually living at my house at the time. I was. Me and Andrew stayed at my house because my dad had, had a, an operation. My mum had moved out due to my own family divorce. And you and Andrew were living at my house. Yeah. I remember me and Andrew waiting for you. For three months you were gone. I was gone on the island, yeah. Right, and when you came back, you were skinny as a rake because yeah. there was no food there or yeah. you had to sustain yourself. Now, after that, you started traveling quite a lot. And I mean, in the sense of we went to Kajice, Slovakia, a few yeah. times. Me, you and Andrew, yeah. you know, and... Because you'd say it was beautiful, which brings me on to say, where did Romania come into the equation? Because I'll be yeah, missing so that link myself. I've always liked Eastern Europe. So the reason I used to go to Košice is because when I was 15, 16, I used to live with that Slovak guy, Peter, who yeah. I still speak with to this day. He's a good friend of mine. And um, he invited me to his hometown once. And I was like, it's clean, it's safe, it's beautiful. Everyone's nice. Everyone's safe. And you hear the word, especially when we're now talking Jesus. 20 years ago, 19 years ago, when you hear the word Slovakia, everyone's like, Slovakia must be a hellhole. I think people are now a lot more wise than they were. Yeah. But um, Romania probably has one of the worst brand names in Europe. And seven and a half, eight years, no, it must have been nine years ago now, uh, there was a big fight show out here and my friend didn't have cornermen. My friend Thomas didn't have a cornerman. And he said, hey, well, do you, I don't have, the show won't pay to fly my cornerman out. Do you and Andrew want to come be my cornerman? Mm -hmm. We said, yeah, let's go check Romania out. And Romania is, was and still is an absolutely wonderful country. And I know people, people want me to talk shit about Romania. And my, well, I've my, been very pleasantly surprised by Romania. I, I I've been here a few times. You know, I lived here f for a while before. You know, you, you've showed me everywhere. Yeah. And, and the, the scenery is stunning. I'm not going to go into that. And England was getting worse and worse. So I just thought, you know what? I've got some good friends in Romania. Property is cheap out there in Romania. So I bought a flat that cost me 40,000 euros for a mm -hmm. nice flat in the mountains in a village near Brasov. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is people dig this stuff up now. Oh, Tristan thinks he's a baller. Of course but we've been do. reading his property records and yeah. he used to live in a 40,000 pound flat. Yeah, well, I was like 20, I was like 27. Like, how is that a dig? <laughs> how is that an insult? Leave me alone. But yeah, obviously now I've got properties in Dubai worth 20 million plus so everyone can shut their mouths. But uh, yeah, I just fell in love with Romania. I really enjoyed it here. I thought it was a wonderful country. I still think it is. Hopefully I'll be able to stay. It depends on how the situation ends. Mm -hmm. But um. Better than England. England's so going downhill. You moved to Romania. You started the webcam business. You yeah. started to do quite financially well because you were in a much better yeah. position when you moved and, to Romania. And than I'd, like I'd, to, I'd like to talk about the webcam business, actually. I'm glad yeah. you asked me about the webcam Okay, let's talk about it. Well, what, you, what people have to understand is this. Right now, people are digging up a bunch of crap from my past about how to run a webcam studio, my instructional videos on how to run a webcam studio. First and foremost... Romania is one of the capitals worldwide for webcam studios. There are po politicians who own webcam studios. I know restaurant owners who own webcam studios on top of the restaurants. Now it's getting less and less popular. Fine. I mean, the business is, has died, essentially. I've been out of the business for many years myself. The business is dying. But if you drive to Bucharest city center right now, I'm not going to say its name. There's a huge billboard. It's been there for years. Seen it. Yeah. yeah. For, for the biggest webcam studio in the city. Yeah, I've seen it. So it's a very popular... Uh, business here. It's completely legal. Everyone pays their taxes. It's a normal line of work. Um, people are digging up old videos now where they're saying, oh, well, you know, they're arrested for human trafficking. Well, look at them talking about having girls working for them. Yeah. The current charges have nothing to do with my old webcam business. And the old webcam business, it was an interesting business to be in. And obviously my brother's converted to Islam now. And a lot of people are trying to reprimand Use it us against for him. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. What, I'll, what I'll say is this. Look, now that me and Andrew are in a position where we can guide young men. We can give young men who perhaps don't have the guidance they need a direction in life. And we've learned the hard way from trying different things, from coming up in a very bad way. We've learned the hard way how to live as men. So nowadays when people are reprimanding me because of when I was 25, I started a webcam studio and everyone's saying, oh, well, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Well, look, I was a 24 year old with no money, struggling to pay the bills, who found a completely legal way to run business, you know? My employees were very happy. They got paid a lot of money. I was very happy. I got paid a lot of money. It was hard work. We were working around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven I days remember, a week. I remember, bro, yeah. I remember. I was there running yeah. wires around the house. Exactly, and, yeah. so, so now yeah. people are, are, are quick to reproach me for how I behaved in the past, as though when I was 25, I was telling everyone in the world, look, young men, 
everyone needs to be like me. I can show you the way. But that wasn't my message back then. I was a man trying to put bread on the table and trying to make money. And when people say, oh, the Tates made all their money in this business, no, we didn't. We made some money. But even back then, I was making less than 20, 15, 20,000 a month. He was doing really well. Yeah, I that, remember. Th that's really well, but you yeah. know how much I make today. That, yeah, it's you know how much I've made in the what last What you make five today years. is disgusting, right? I don't <laughs> want to go into that. Yeah, because, but my point you know, is, my real financial success came after all of that. Of course, so, yes. So, you know, I, 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 I like talking about the webcam business. I think it's very important. I talk about it even more now than ever before because mm -hmm. people are uh, Twitter detectives who think they can solve this case by finding out I used to run a webcam company, when I used to do podcasts about it all the time, yeah. are, are banging their heads against the wall because the police know I used to run a webcam studio. The people trying to frame me knows I used to run a webcam studio. Everyone involved knows I used to run a webcam studio. And there's nothing to do with a webcam studio in my criminal charges because it's a legal tax payable business and everyone in Romania runs one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we, we They start, can use it as much as they like. It's nothing to do with the case. The people on Twitter can talk about it as much as of they course. like. Yeah. But what they can't do is make the police put me talking about a webcam studio in the criminal file because that's not a crime at all. So yeah, I did run a, run a webcam studio and that was, um, you know, I, I was doing very, very well. 15, 20,000 a month, I guess, 10 years ago. That's a lot of money to someone who has no money. Bro. Oh yeah, that's a 10, lot 10 years ago yeah. and considering 13 years ago, I was completely broke. It was, it was very good money. And that's when me and Andrew first started buying like the Lamborghinis and things like that. Where did the idea of Hustlers University and the war room come about? Because I remember Andrew talking about you know, yeah. when he started to build it. Where did the idea come from? Well, it's very interesting because me and Andrew have been under attack for a while. We now look back and they've tried to nip us in the bud. We didn't even realize at the time. Six years ago was the first time Andrew got banned on Twitter because he had an argument with J.K. Rowling about mental health. I remember, yeah. yeah. And now J.K. Rowling is... is anti uh, transgender and stuff she's uh, she's coming around to the right side so i guess maybe one day maybe I'll buy, you've influenced her, right? one, one day i'll buy her a drink who knows but they had some kind of argument and andrew got banned for talking about mental health on twitter did you ever believe that the war room and hostage university would grow to the size it is today no and it's, it's not about the size it's about the power that they have mm -hmm. so when andrew first got cancelled on twitter he thought you know what i'm gonna start a, a, my own little network i'm gonna charge what was it, 300 pounds a year for access to it. I'm going to call it Andrew Tate's War Room. And this way I can speak with the people who resonate with my message and, you know, build this little network group without Twitter because I'm banned on Twitter anyway. Yeah. So it was actually the people who tried to cancel us who have always made us stronger. So that, those were the beginnings of the War Room. And it wasn't that the War Room was such a great product because me and Andrew were in it that made it what it is. It was the quality of the people who signed up to the War Room that mm -hmm. made it what it is. I want to make this very clear. War, the war room was built by the people within it. There was a point about two years into it where we kicked half the people out because we realized, no, oh, kick them out. We don't need their money anymore. We don't need the mem membership fee. It was what more we about having the high, high value. Quality people. So you know what, Let, let's triple the price. Yeah. Screw it. Yeah. High value, good people only. And that's when the war room became what it is. That's a great dynamic. Yeah, so, so the war room is a, is a very successful business network and, it, and it, I think it always will be. The war room isn't going anywhere. Yeah. And the war room had my back when I was in jail. They know exactly you know, the kind of attack that's happening on me. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the war room is a, is a wonderful person. And I've made some very good friends from the war room. Yeah. You've I, met, I've met a few of them. Met, yeah. you've, met, you know what? you've met Iggy. You've met Jewel. You've met Justin. They're you've good met guys. Me. And these are people I've yeah. met through the war room, yeah. which is insane. So yeah. I can now, although I have my old group of friends, because I vetted them when I was young, through loyalty, through, you know, we all had the same message. You know, I used to say, I used to lie and say, you never have more than five friends your whole life and that was a lie because what you have to understand is you're walking through the world hoping to meet these friends by random by random chance you're going to run into a guy with the same values as you the same mission as you the same mindset as you the same goals as you who's aligned in every way you're not going to meet those people walking through the world but i now have at least 30 real friends 35 real friends who i call my real friends yeah people you haven't met yeah tig julian there's so many guys yeah. from within the war room who i've made really great friendships with because I'm not walking through the world trying to find them. We're all in the same room. That's now. right, you're all in the We're same room. We're all in the same room. Which I think so, is a yeah. very clever dynamic yeah. with how you brought so, that so together. The, so the war room is absolutely amazing. With that said, I mean, you've got Hustlers University now and I've seen, oh, I've seen thousands of young men yeah. absolutely smashing it through the real world. Absolutely. Right? And so the real world teaches people how to make money online, you know, how, how to make a legit business online yeah. and make money. They, they learn different skills. I think it was, there's tens of skills in there you yeah. can learn. Now. Sales, affiliate marketing, dropshipping, okay. lots. Of, yeah, absolutely. So that obviously 
that's blown your fame up massively. Yeah, you and Andrew. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that when anyone, it's all about showing results and showing receipts. You know, when we and Andrew were young, we didn't know anyone with money really. Like, no, if, if I could, if I could get a chance to speak to someone with money. Um, I, I'd take the opportunity and try and grill their brain for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now for $49 a month, young men could sign up and have 18 different campuses, all taught by legitimate millionaires who've all made money way before they were in the real world, who are actively teaching them everything that they need to make money in the exact same way. It's such a powerful resource because no matter what job you work, you can afford forty nine dollars. Yes, that's right. So no, it's it's a it's absolutely. I've, I've seen I've seen young men smashing it, making thousands of there, money. There was a, right? there was a kid the other day who made eighteen thousand dollars in, in a single one, day. In a one day. In a single yeah, day. I know who he Let's is. Let's not say his name, but no, he, in, I know in who a single he is. day, and he's sixteen years old. So it, it, to, to finish off, I just think it's it's absolutely incredible, and this is why I think me and Andrew are under attack as well because we tell people the typical go to university. I'm going to get onto that. I'm yeah. going to get onto that. There we go. go what on. I will say is. So you got famous. Did that ever change the way that you lived? Because I can say hands down, I don't think you guys have changed at all. Yeah. You know, you've always been the same people. People think that you change when you, you get money and you get this fame. You've never changed the way you live. Is that right? Or have you had to be a bit more careful about certain things? Oh, I mean, in terms of the way I live, I guess that has changed. Certainly the, the luxury of it all. But um, how careful you have to be with your security, with who takes your photos, with who leaks information. You have to be careful with lots of stuff. But... What I will say is this, money does only changes you if you're not a genuine person. Mm -hmm. Money reveals who you really are. That's it. If you're, if you're a real dickhead, but you walk around kissing everyone's ass, being nice to them all the time in the hopes of getting something, yeah. the moment you have a hundred million dollars, yeah. you're going to become a dickhead to everybody because that's who you are inside. If you're a, genuine, a genuinely good person and you run into a truckload of money somewhere, you're just gonna be. You're just gonna continue to be a good person. And I mean, I've seen you guys help a lot of people. Well, I've increased the amount of charity I do certainly. Yeah. But I, I was always the guy who was willing to help yeah. out. People have to turn a blind eye to that as well. They, well, people, you know, they. A lot of people didn't. A lot of my haters didn't know me until this attack started. So now they're following me and watching what I'm doing and being like, "Oh, look, they're doing so much charity since ever since they got attacked in this way." And I'm like, no, but the people who know me, who have been my fans for five years, six years, mm -hmm. have seen me doing this forever, as long as they know me. I'm always willing to help people out. So if you're a good person, money just makes you a, a, a more, doesn't make you a better person. Mm -hmm. It makes you more capable at, on acting on your goodwill that you have towards other people. Of course. That's it. I want to change the subject now to something a bit more serious. Okay. You went to jail. Yeah. Well, that's not serious. Jail was fine. Okay. Jail was fine to you because you have an iron mind. Thank you. Now, I believe that the reason you went to jail is because you upset a certain narrative of your promotion of masculinity and the things that you say. You know, I've, I've heard people say that. Yeah. I believe that the allegations are fabricated to stop you from promoting you know, masculinity and the, you know, they label you as toxic and yeah. misogynists and everything else that the yes. mainstream like to call you. Now, did jail... I, don't, I know that jail didn't change you as a person, but while you were in jail, did it reveal to you who your true friends were? Did it reveal to you you know, who cared and who didn't about you and Andrew? Did it ch well, you, change your views on people? Yeah, well, yeah, but uh, something like that naturally would, you know. You mm -hmm. have the people who... who and, and I'm glad I have friends like you, actually, because I couldn't have, been, I couldn't have kept track of this. I had no internet access. I didn't, I didn't even have any phone calls. I didn't make a phone call for the entire time I was in jail. So I had meetings with my lawyer, and that was it. But, yeah, you certainly see who speaks up or who immediately knows that it's bullshit. Uh -huh. Within the first week or two, there were people like you, people like Tucker Carlson even, mm -hmm. saying, there is something wrong with this. These guys have hundreds of millions of dollars. They're obviously attractive enough. They've kidnapped people? For, for what? Like, mm -hmm. why have they done this? There are people who immediately spoke out against this. And I'll always appreciate those people. And then there are people now, seven months in, when the whole thing is looking really ropey, mm -hmm. are saying, oh, well, there's something wrong with this case. I'm well, gonna stop you there, because you need to hear this. Go on. I was at a family meal when I found out that you and Andrew had been brought to jail, it was, yeah. it was, I think it was New Year's Eve, was it? It was the 29th. 29th, just before New Year's Eve. And I remember being told, Andrew and Tristan are on the news, they've been locked up. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, so I opened my phone and I seen it. And I went straight home, straight home, I left. I had to go, I thought, nah, this can't be true. I got home, I thought, fucking hell. So I'm banging my head on the wall, what the <laughs> fuck can I do? Nothing, there's nothing I can do. There was nothing anyone could do, sadly. I signed up to Twitter 
because the amount of attacks that were coming from people was yeah. insane. And I thought, I have to do something. So I signed up to Twitter and I posted one picture of you and Andrew in the, uh, coming out of the police van. Mm -hmm. And I said, I've known these guys 17 years. They've never trafficked nobody. You know, that was the only thing I could do. And then James English messaged me, asking me to come on a podcast. He's a good guy. Which yeah. is how I met James English, right? Yeah. We're still friends today. James is a great guy. So, you know, it, it, was, it was very hard for the people around you because everyone felt helpless, right? Yeah. And everyone was helpless, even my mm -hmm. lawyers. It, it's a case, and I, I can't go into it too much, but it's not the typical way cases are done anywhere in the world, even here. Like, this was very unusual. And the, it's all going to come out eventually of exactly what happened and why and how it was done and the mistakes that were made. And, you know, everyone's going to have to, I guess, without, without trying to sound threatening, pay for their mistakes. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, justice has to be done and uh, God is going to make sure justice gets done. I'm going to make sure justice gets done. And even to, if they drop the case tomorrow, that's not justice. What, 15 months of my life, three months in jail, this many months on house arrest, the amount of money I've lost, my reputational damage. If they drop the case tomorrow, is that justice? I have argued with endless idiots yeah. from our hometown about these guys' innocence. And, you know, it's, it's insulting. It's insulting. Well, let's, I've, I've got a good example. When I was growing up, I had many friends who did illegal things, saying no names. You know, there's, there's some people I used to hang around with who did illegal things. I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't drop anyone in it. No, I never. Yeah, don't I say mean, their if, names. If, if, if he was here sitting right in front of me right now, I wouldn't mention it. No, that's good. But I'm a good guy. Yeah. But all of my friends who like to do illegal things and crimes, tilt it back. There we go. Tristan, I thought you were rich. I am rich. So why doesn't your light away? Oh. Ah, see? Doesn't work for poor hands. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. All my friends were ex-criminals. What's crazy is this. I was broke, hungry, couldn't pay the electricity, couldn't buy good food, couldn't put petrol in my car. They'd always propose to me some illegal scheme. Oh, if we just do this or go here or take this or sell this, maybe we'd make some money. And throughout my entire life when I was broke, I said no. I never engaged in any illegal activity. I'll say it right now on the internet. I will confess because I got caught. The only illegal thing I ever did was sell copied music CDs at my high school when I was 14. That's the only illegal business I've ever run. You criminal. I know. Let's look, sue me, Universal Records. So, uh, but throughout my entire life, anyone who proposed doing anything illegal, no matter how broke I was, I said no. So it doesn't matter what anyone thinks of me. To believe that I'm a human trafficker, you have to believe this. I'm now, at the time, I'm 33 years old. Yeah. I'm already worth 100 plus million dollars. I already have kids. I, I obviously you have any most, I can get a beautiful woman in any city in the world that I want. I'm not lonely. Uh, I'm in good shape. I'm a retired sportsman. I'm pretty famous. My, I'm recognizable. What, well, two and a bit years ago, not so much, but I was, I was quite mm. famous. Everyone in the world would recognize mine and Andrew's face. And me and Andrew sat around and said, I know, I have a great idea. Let's start human trafficking. <laughs> That's what you have to believe to believe this yeah. case is true. Yeah. And people are reading, I, I mean, I know what the evidence they're trying to use is. They're reading kinky text messages between girls I know. Saying, Taking oh, yeah, text out yeah. of context. Oh, you're mine. Aha, mm -hmm. when you come to the South, I'm never going to let you go. Like, just they, like, they're using that as evidence? No, they're trying. Girls who say, this, these are, this is not evidence, I'm not a victim. By the way. But like, they're finding the most stupid shit to use as evidence. And how does that make you feel in the sense of courts and trials? You now... No, I, I believe in courts and I believe in trials. You believe that's and fair? I, yeah, well, I believe in the Romanian justice system in terms of the court system. Because the, there are two judges who were told to keep me in jail who said, nope, let these boys go. Uh, last week, there was a court of appeal judge who said, nope, I've seen all the evidence, let these boys go. Yep. They lost the argument with other judges but there are judges in the system who are completely fair and they know what's going on. The investigation process, I can't be so kind about because I believe the people who ran the investigation knew immediately that I wasn't a criminal. They were just determined to prove it because it would help their career and somehow. But, you know, God is going to decide what happens to me and regardless of what they do, the evidence is going to have to be shown to the world. Well, I will say, I yeah. know this man for a long time, and I can say, with a hand on my heart, this man is not a criminal. I say, now, the, on, the only thing I've ever forced a woman to do in this house is to leave. And that's, <laughs> uh, hand on my heart, that's the truth. The only thing I've ever forced anyone to do in this house is to leave. But, uh, yeah, so, 
it's all going to come out in the end. Right now, we can't talk about it too much. But we'll do another interview when I'm allowed to dis- if, dissect the case. If you could go back and change anything, would you? No. Why? You know, because people are trying to tell me stupid things. Again, like, really, I'm a Christian now. A bunch of really conservative Christians are like, well, 10 years ago, the business you were involved in was immoral. Like I said, I was a kid from the streets. I had no money. I found a legal business to run. Immoral, maybe. Illegal, no. I found a legal business to run that I thought was a great moneymaker at the time. I ran it professionally. I did make some money. Fine. I was an atheist back then. I didn't have much guidance back then. And all the mistakes I've made in my life, because I don't even consider that a mistake, but all the mistakes I've made in my life have led me to where I am today. So I don't want to change anything about my current situation. So if I could go back in time and change anything in my past, I wouldn't. Okay. I'm very happy where I am. So if you could give advice to 16-year-old Tristan today, other than stay away from Rory, (laughs) what would it be? Um... I wouldn't want to tell him anything that would impact his future. Yeah. I would like him to do everything. I'd like him to have the kickboxing fights he had, get his nose broken, lose the fights he lost because he didn't train enough, make them run his stupid webcam studio, yeah. you know, sell it, fail in the TV advertising business, not be able to pay his electricity. I, want, I would like him to go through everything. I would just say, call your parents more often. Call your dad more. That's the only thing I would go back in time and tell him. Excellent. I'm going to round it up. I'm going to say, look, I know who you are as a person. I know your family. I know your true characters. You know, I've known you for a very long time. And whatever happens, I'm going to be there. I know. I'm going to be there. And I'm, going to, I'm going to fight to the end for you guys. Come visit me in jail if they send me. Listen, it would be the best VR you've ever had. But yeah, I'm going to round that up. And I just want to say thank you for letting me ask you these questions today. You didn't have to. Anytime. You know, and I feel very honored to have you here on my podcast as I am a very small platform. Which reminds me to say, if you have liked what you've seen, please like and subscribe. And thank you guys for watching and we will see you on the next episode. Hopefully I have another very interesting guest lined up. But no, I'm going to round that up now. Thank you guys very much. And Tristan, I'll see you in in the the kitchen for a drink. (laughs) Good night and God bless. Good night. Take care, guys.